I want to welcome everyone here to the class where we're going to be doing the, the last uh, last letter to Asia Minor, and that's to uh, Laodicea. And uh, we'll get started with it with a blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kid shanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivana la sok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commands and commands us to engross ourselves in Torah. All right, tonight, um, like I said, we will be looking at the last letter to the churches in um, Laodicea. And um, that, uh, we'll just kind of look at, okay, where's, here we go. Laodicea, as you can see down there, is um, it's down in the right-hand corner of all the stars. And it's about 40 miles southeast of uh, Philadelphia and about 90 miles uh, east of uh, Ephesus. Now, Laodicea, it was named uh, by Antiochus II of Syria in honor of his wife. And so he probably got lots of brownie points for that. It was one of the wealthiest cities in the, uh, in the world. And they specialized in uh, in banking, you know, finance. Uh, they they had some goats that lived in the in the area, and um, they um, uh, produced a, a particular kind of uh, black uh, wool. And so from that, then the uh, uh, people there in uh, Laodicea had um, uh, they they made a, a cloth out of this this black wool and evidently it was a, a very rich cloth and um, and was highly sought after. And then the other thing that they did was uh, they had a large medical uh, center there and a temple to, uh, to Asclepia uh, and uh, they exported a particular kind of, of um, eye salve that was, it was very popular and they were able to send that all over the world and uh, all over the Roman world, as it were. So um, Laodicea, Laodicea, however you want to pronounce it, uh, it was an important city in the Roman Empire. It was a very wealthy one, and uh, several times, you know, they uh, um, they would try to, you know, kind of leave, get cast off the Romans a little bit because they had so much money. They didn't need their their particular. Um, largesse and then uh, of course then the Romans took advantage of them and, and uh, tried to you know they they would yeah they would tax the hoodle out of them but um, it did have uh, a large kind of a, a good size Jewish population and uh, like other cities in this area of Asia Minor um, it was a center of, of uh, emperor worship you know the Caesar worship and uh, also the worship, as I said, uh, of the um, the healing god Asclepius. And there was a, fam a famous temple there in uh, Laodicea. And uh, then they um, had the medical school that was connected with, with this temple. And one can just imagine what kind of medicine they taught back in those days. But, uh, and the as best they could and as best that they knew, that's uh, that's what they taught. And after an earthquake had uh, that devastated um, the the region, you remember there was one in the 60 A.D. that that destroyed um, oh the other the other city, uh, Philadelphia was one of them, and Sardis was another. You know they really uh, really uh, hit them hard. Uh, Laodicea, they refused imperial help or the Roman help in rebuilding their city. They, they successfully rebuilt it with their own resources. They didn't need the outside help. They didn't ask for it, and they didn't want it. So Laodicea was uh, too rich to accept help from anyone. Tacitus, the uh, Roman uh, historian, uh, tells us that uh, Laodicea arose from the ruins by the strength of our own resources and with no help from us. 
So uh, they they didn't really have to rely on the uh, the Roman government for anything. They they had enough money of their own. Uh, Laodicea was uh, also a, a noted uh, commercial center. Like I said, it had uh, uh, banking and then uh, you know, some of some of its goods, like this ISAV and so forth, was exported all over the world. And uh, it's uh, frequently noted that Laodicea provided its uh, prided itself in three things: financial wealth its extensive textile industry and this ISAB. Those were the three, the three biggies. Now, one of the things though that uh, were a problem with Laodicea was that um, they had a drinking problem there. Now, it's not what you think. The, uh, the, the problem with their drinking water was that, uh, drinking was that uh, they had uh, very, very poor uh, quality water that um, it made them, uh, you know, they had to import their water from uh, from um, uh, other other sources, uh, Hierapolis and uh, Colos that they had to, to get their water from. And uh, so that made uh, Laodicea very vulnerable to attack through a siege because all they had to do is just cut the, uh, the water supply and uh, they were toast. If an uh, enemy army surrounded the city, they had insufficient water supplies in the city. They didn't have cisterns uh, sufficient for anything, and uh, it could easily be cut off. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the leaders of Laodicea were always accommodating to whatever, um, whatever you know, entity was out there after them, they, they had to be very accommodating and basically they would give up without a fight because they want, wanted to negotiate and compromise uh, instead of a fight. And they had the money that they could, they could actually do it. Now, their main water supply came from a six mile aqueduct from the hot springs of Hierapolis. Now, uh, this water uh, was a, it was a famous, this place, uh, Hierapolis was was famous as a uh, healing spa kind of thing. Like we would have, uh, you know, Hot Springs, Arkansas, and uh, other other places where they have these hot uh, mineral baths, and people would go there just for the 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 healing therapeutic value of it. I guess they would say. And uh, so they would pipe these. Um, here, here's a picture of the ruins of uh, of uh, Laodicea. Um, and you know, pretty extensive there. Uh, but they would uh, they would pipe this stuff in, and uh, I think I've got a oh, there's a picture, a great big old eyeball from the from the ISAP. Then I got a picture later on uh, of the of the pipes that uh, that they used to, to to pipe their water. In fact, let me look at that. Here's here's one right there. The hot and cold channels. They did. They had hot and cold water coming into uh, the city. Now, um, they, uh, when the water would arrive from um, Hierapolis, it was no longer piping hot like it was, you know, when it, uh, when it got into the pipeline. It was, it was warm. It was laden with chemicals. It, um, uh, once the hot, hot water got uh, not so hot, then um, it uh, didn't smell so hot either. And what they and they would have to actually have clean out places along the uh, the pipeline so that they could get in there and get rid of the chemicals that uh, that or the minerals that uh, uh, were in the water. Now, it, uh, the best I could uh, describe it, I guess, um, if any of you have lived in areas where you have like sulfur water. Um, when we uh, when we lived up in Illinois, there were places where um, the water that people got in their wells was uh, it was sulfur water, and uh, it you know it you know I guess if you lived in the house you would get used to it, but um, um, boy when you would visit there. Um, it was it was nasty, and I understand even out where we live that uh, there are some people that uh, 
when they dug down into uh, the, you know, to get their wells, they didn't particularly get deep enough. And uh, they have some water that's, uh, yeah, it's not the best in the world. They, the, you know, for us out here where we live, you know, we would go down, I think my well is 320 feet, something like that. And then other people, and I've got good water. And then other people came up with, you know, 100 feet and, and uh, they got water, but it's, it's not the best. Um, so that's the problem that uh, they had with, uh, with water coming into uh, Laodicea. Now, um, let's go ahead and look at the, the, uh, the salutation, as it were, um, from uh, that Yeshua is talking to um, Laodicea. It says, to the angel of Messiah's community in Laodicea write, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Now, remember from the other other letters to the other churches when it says to the angel of Messiah's community, they're talking about probably the leader of the congregation, whether, I don't know what they would call him, whether they would call him a, um, um, a pastor or you know, a shepherd or leader, or I don't, I don't know. We really don't know what they, they called them. Um, I don't think at that point in time uh, that uh, anyone called them like a rabbi or something like that, because that was that was much later. Um, and then also in the in in the what became the Christian Church, obviously they would never have used a, a Jewish term like the rabbi uh, for that purpose. So Yeshua addressed the church at at uh, Laodicea as the Amen. The Amen, the uh, and so it's the so be it, I guess uh, you'd say it, or it is done. That's what the the uh, word actually means is, uh, in the Hebrew is, you know, it it uh, let it be let it be so, um, and uh, then in uh, it's like in Second Corinthians uh, one twenty says, for all the promises of God in Him in Yeshua are yes. And in him, amen. Uh, so uh, Yeshua is the actual, he's the personification of uh, and the affirmation of the truth of God. He is the one, he's the, he is the truth. Uh, Yeshua was also called the faithful and true witness. And the, uh, um, you know, he was, he was trustworthy. Whereas the uh, Laodiceans had a, um, they had a reputation for they would say and do anything uh, just to preserve themselves. You know, they were they were kind of vulnerable, so that that kind of made them a um, uh, gave them a vulnerable personality in many ways. And so, uh, because they did have a lot of money, they could protect themselves only so far, and then they would negotiate out of, of whatever it was and and they would you know they would uh, no amount of, no amount of treachery was uh, too much to uh, save their hide so that's the reputation that they that they had um, and so uh, in contrast to that of course is is Yeshua who was always faithful and true and it says uh, described himself lastly as the the origin or the originator of God's uh, of the creation of God, and I think in uh, in our yeah the originator of God's creation, and so um, the idea behind this word the beginning of the the origin the originator it's a Greek word uh, arche that is uh, it's, it means the ruler the source or the origin and not um, not first in a sequential order, because there are some that, uh, you know, deniers of, of Yeshua's uh, um, deity that would say, well, it says he was the first one created. No, he was not the first one created. Uh, this verse does not teach that Yeshua was first being created, but uh, that he is the ruler, source, and origin of all creation. And it's, it's got the idea first in prominence, rather than first in sequence, if you, if you get it. So he's the most powerful, the, the uh, authoritative one. So this sets forth his authority also to pass judgment 
um, on uh, on whomever on the world, and uh, eventually when he becomes the uh, the uh, ruler of the, of the earth, and it says he'll rule the earth with an iron rod. Okay, going on. The uh, Revelation uh, three fifteen through seventeen says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. Uh, oh, that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I am about to spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have made myself wealthy, and I need nothing. But you do not know that you are miserable and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. All right. Um, the, um, let's see, Daniel says that this verse, uh, re uh, references Proverbs 8, 22, um, which, uh, which, which verse is that? Let me un unmute you there. Uh, which, uh, verse is that this, um, being hot or cold, um, Daniel or, or, uh, the, um, the other one, I'm rich. Sorry, that was me. Um, the, that was referencing the originator of God's creation. Oh, okay. So it, it references that uh, Adonai brought me forth the first of his way before he works, uh, before his works of old. Okay. So it, in, in my online Bible, it, it's got a, a notation since referencing Proverbs, uh, 822 or whatever I wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's the idea that, uh, he was the prominent, you know, because uh, the Bible also says that the world was created. He created the world, and uh, nothing that was created was uh, was created without him. So um, Yeshua was, you know, he was instrumental in the creation of the world. He was with God. He was God. And, you know, it's just uh, the idea that he was a created being uh, is uh, one that uh, those those that uh, say that Yeshua is not divine and that he was created instead. So um, that's that's where that originator of uh, creation, what it should mean is that he was not the first creature or first thing created, but he was uh, prominent, uh, the head of the head of the class, and he was he was there creating right at the beginning. So all right now. Um, Again, you know, we see here in all the letters to um, to the churches, Yeshua starts out with when he's talking to him, he says, "And I know your works." So, you know, each each and every time he he says, "I know uh, your works," and then he comes up with something that describes that uh, that congregation in relation also to not their maybe their location, their history, their culture, their personality or uh, or whatever so um, now um, just before we get started we're uh, uh, on the rest of this uh, let me ask anybody um, what uh, you know where it says that I'd rather you be cold or hot now um, what do you mean you can pretty well understand okay what does it mean by being hot you know that the, the Lord uh, would say I'd rather you be hot uh, but what about being cold? Anybody got any ideas of why he would say, I'd rather you be cold? Because, you know, when we think of, of a, a Christian, you know, their, their faith is being cold and, and, uh, and so forth. Anybody got an idea of uh, what, that would, uh, what that would entail? In, in well, the, the way I look at it is it's a stance. In other words, you're either for it or you're against it, but when you ride the fence, that, that and that's our opinion. So we always use homosexuality as it. You know, God says it's bad, but there's a lot of Christians that say, well, it doesn't hurt anybody. Let them do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. So that's that's lukewarm. That's not taking a stance either way. Okay. Okay. And uh, and and uh, Joseph said, yeah, that's cold as in. You know, not on the fence. Get off the fence. You know, try to quit riding, trying to ride the fence and have it both ways. Okay. Um, maybe we'll look at it just a little bit different. Anybody else got a, a comment on, on what the cold might be? All right. Um, 
Now, this church, they received no commendation at all. And uh, that's, that what, that's kind of what makes it unique among all of the, um, all of the other churches. That, you know, the, other, the other churches, Yeshua said, you know, he had something sort of nice to say uh, to them. You know, it wasn't really, um, um, some, in some cases, it might have been kind of an offhand compliment or kind of a, uh, you know, excuse the, the pun here, a lukewarm compliment. But uh, it did have, you know, some kind of a, of a compliment here, but uh, not for the Laodiceans. The, the lackadaisical deeds of these uh, Laodicean believers, um, you know, it, it showed their, their heart attitude. They were, they were neither hot nor cold in their, in their love for God, just meh, just, just plain lukewarm. Um, you know, and the beverages... You know, it seems like that the beverages, you know, you, uh, they, they go down better. If they're cold, you know, like a cold uh, a drink, cold drink of water when it's hot or uh, hot, I mean, a hot chocolate or hot coffee when uh, uh, you know, in the mornings or when, you know, when it's uh, cold outside. They, they, you need that, that temperature difference, the, the gradient to make it appealing. And uh, so, you know, maybe the Lord would rather have his people cold or hot with their love for him, but, but not apathetic. Uh, the Laodiceans uh, should have known how the, the Lord felt because their city's drinking water came from the, the spring six miles uh, 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 to the south at, uh, at Hierapolis. And uh, it arrived, they say, disgustingly lukewarm and then I've, I've read uh, some instances where people uh, had reported that when they were at uh, Laodicea and they would get a drink of water from the the fountain or whatever that uh, the, it was it was they you know they maybe maybe it didn't smell or something I don't know but uh, they would take a drink of it and it was so nasty that uh, they would throw it up because it, it just was not good um, the neighboring uh, Hierapolis had hot spring water, like I'd explained, and it was valuable for medicinal purposes. And uh, on its way down to Laodicea, it lost some of its heat and consequently its medicinal value. And by the time it ri arrived uh, overland or on the aqueduct, uh, it, had, uh, it had cooled down considerably. Now, um, the there's the city uh, near uh, the nearby city of Colos, which you know that was the the congregation that uh, Paul wrote to the Colossians. Uh, that's the uh, the city is Colos. Now they had uh, the opposite. They were uh, in a higher elevation. They had water that was real nice and cold, and it was refreshing as a as a beverage. It was uh, really uh, really nice. So. Um, this idea that Yeshua would tell somebody that they would uh, uh, rather be a church of, uh, you know, be cold or hot, uh, but rather than lukewarm, it always kind of bothered me as to, well, why would he say, look, I'd rather you just be a cold Christian. And that has connotations of, uh, of uh, something that's undesirable. But uh, maybe... Um, um, you know, look at it this way. How about the water that was at Colos? It was very cold and it could be very refreshing. And uh, so he's telling them perhaps maybe uh, that I'd really like to, you guys would be really a good cold drink of water and refreshing uh, or to be the hot water at uh, Hierapolis so that, you know, it's, it's therapeutic, and you get into the water, and it and it uh, you know makes the old bones not so creaky. Uh, I'd rather you be like that than uh, to be this lukewarm mess that uh, um, that we uh, we have there at Laodicea. And, and here again, here's the uh, the uh, um, aqueducts or the uh, pipes that they had, and you can see. Uh, down here, um, I think you can you can see that. Um, 
Well, I don't know. Let's see. Well, I'm, I'm trying to draw a, a, a pointer here. Okay, you see right in here, uh, that is, those are calcium or, or uh, mineral deposits uh, there around the, um, um, around the pipe. So, um, let's go back then to, uh, or keep on going here. And that's the, the slide that I had on there uh, all along, but uh, um, just reviewing Laodicea had no commendation and uh, he said that rather, you know, rather you be hot or cold, but uh, uh, not, not in the middle. Now, uh, let me ask a, a question again. Now, does anybody, uh, what about that? The idea that uh, the beverage or the drink or the whatever would be nice and cold does that give you a, does that shed kind of a different light on what Yeshua might have been talking about um, as uh, as it related to he'd rather you be cold or hot uh, and you know maybe we got it kind of kind of wrong that when we're talking about cold he wasn't talking about cold believers uh, he was maybe calling uh, he says you know cold invigorating and uh, and uh, refreshing uh, that sort of a, of a believer. Um, because, you know, we've, we've all, I, you know, I've seen people that you get around them and their, their enthusiasm was just, uh, just infectious. You know, they, uh, they would, uh, um, just everything about them was, was, uh, enjoyable. So, um, maybe, I don't know, perhaps that's, uh, that's, um, what it might be. Anybody got any, any thoughts or comments on that? So if if cold is that, then what is hot? Well, hot is also it's it's also good uh, in that uh, the the two ends of the spectrum would be good. The cold would be refreshing. The hot would be um, therapeutic. In like uh, the the springs at Hierapolis, they were the the hot springs that people would get into the baths, and uh, it was supposed to be you know, those mineral baths, and, and, you know, people do it even today, you know, uh, uh, they used to go to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and then Sarasota Springs in, uh, in New York, and uh, maybe Yosemite, and um, um, so I, I, I don't know, um, I think that's what he was talking about, the, the hot uh, Christian or the hot believer uh, would be one that would be beneficial, one that would uh, would have a, a value, the same as the cold could have a value too. He's, so uh, it makes more sense to me then that he would say, I wish you were a cold, invigorating, um, uh, refreshing uh, water, uh, you know, beverage or the hot, steamy, mineral-laden bath so that you get in there and, you know, and... Uh, uh, you know, especially for old guys, you know, that uh, get in there and the, uh, you know, you don't have as many creaky bones and it, uh, it makes you feel good. Um, so, you know, I don't know, that's, uh, it was something that I thought of uh, when I was studying for this thing that, you know, maybe we got it wrong uh, or, or at least a, a little different idea of that. So the, the well, cold could be good and the hot could be good. Yeah, we always pictured it as well because we're we're got to remember we've taught mainly ourselves so when we look at the hot or cold we kind of use the the hot and cold game you know oh you're cold you're cold and as you get closer to it you get lukewarm or you get hot absolutely so, well and you're not <laughs> you're not alone in that because i think that is the main line um mainline Christian teaching on that is when you're saying that uh, you're cold, you're a cold Christian, that you're, that you're, uh, you know, in, in, uh, you're not worth anything, but because uh, you've given up in, and so forth, like that same idea, but no, you're cold, you're cold. And, and, uh, um, and a lot of, kind of, you know, a lot of places, connotations of cold are bad. Um, and, uh, you know, because you're shivering and it's snowing and you're miserable. And uh, 
than other people, uh, you know, like uh, like me. You know, that's the way I look at cold is I don't like to be cold. But on a nice hot day, cold uh, cold water, a cold beverage uh, is something that can be very, very nice. So, um, you know, that's that's just one way of looking at it. I thought we'd, uh, we'd kind of throw it out there and and uh and see what it says i'm i'm going to read uh, joseph's uh comment here before we go on he said read some commentaries that relate the different churches in uh, revelation 2 and 3 to be the various church ages do you think uh laodicea is our present lukewarm church age well i think uh i mean that's uh uh that interpretation is very popular among uh, dispensationalists uh, joseph and while you know there may be some merit to it, I think that you could find those types of uh, churches and and the the different uh, you know stages that they were in or the different personalities that they had. You could probably find that um, that type of church all throughout the ages. You know, it it w wouldn't necessarily be restricted to just a certain dispensation. And um, so I, I personally prefer to think that uh, uh, what, what they're talking about here is just kind of seven personalities of, uh, of uh, congregations that uh, all of us should uh, probably try to uh, um, you know, pay attention to and either avoid or emulate, as the case may be, um, certain aspects, you know, certainly uh, uh, Ephesus had a lot of good things and uh, Philadelphia had a lot of good things and the other ones were kind of a mixed bag with some good and then some bad. So you try to learn from the from the bad and uh, and not do that. And at the same time, you, you know, try to uh, do what the 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 good things that the uh, that the other churches uh, did. So, um, you know, but that you're right, that is a very popular teaching um, in, uh, in some circles today that it was the, the various ages. And uh, I think it's, it's probably uh, not, as, um, not as cut and dried as that. I think that we would, we would uh, you could see that throughout, you know, various ages in, uh, in the churches because, you know, uh, you'd have periods of revival and then periods of uh, flat, you know, and then back to revival and then flat again. So, you know, uh, I would I would think that it's just uh, seven personalities that, okay, let's look at these and glean the good from it and cast away the bad. So, um, you know, we know that lukewarm uh, kind of uh, lukewarm lives turn people away from Yeshua. Um, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, you've seen people that are, say, believers, and you, and you go, uh, you know, why would I want to be like that? Uh, Charles Spurgeon, you know, the, the famous uh, English preacher there says, uh, now, lukewarm professor, he's, he's, you know, he's always pontificating here, says, what do worldlings see in you? They see a man who see, says he is going to heaven, but who is only traveling at a snail's pace. He professes to believe that there is a, a hell, yet he has tearless eyes, and he never seeks to snatch souls from going down into the pit. They see before them one who has to deal with eternal realities, yet he is but half awake. One who professes to have passed through a transformation so mysterious and wonderful that there must be, if it's true, a vast change in the outward life as the result of it. Yet they see him as much like themselves as can be. He may be morally consistent in his general behavior, but they see no energy in his religious character. So that uh, every once in a while, I like to read Spurgeon because he's he is uh, he's eloquent, and um, sometimes his uh, his you know his stuff is is cutting like this. I mean, it's kind of cutting, and um, it's it's fun. I mean, just, especially just to just to read stuff from 150 years ago. They had a completely different 
uh, way of expressing things, and, and it's kind of fun to, to look at. But uh, that's what he's saying. Here's a guy that professes to be a, a believer, and yet uh, there's just no enthusiasm in him, and uh, he shows up uh, to church on Sunday morning and uh, Sunday night, and oh my goodness, he's a good one. He may even go to Bible study on Wednesday night. But it's just ho-hum. And um, that's, that's what Spurgeon is talking about. That um, another thing I noticed on, on this uh, deal with, uh, with uh, Laodicea, that when Yeshua addressed uh, Laodicea, he said, to the church of the Laodiceans, um, and all of the other churches, he basically said, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Philadelphia. To the church, you know, he just, he said the church at a location. But here's the only one that he said to the church of the Laodiceans. Um, and uh, from what I, I hear, uh, you know, read is uh, Laodicea, it uh, it has a meaning of, um, um, oh, self, uh, self-rule. self or um, the idea that uh, we make up our own rules uh, here. And so what he's saying is, okay, you guys, that uh, your, your democratic rules, as, as it were, you make up your own, your own stuff as you go. And so that's why he uh, addressed them. So it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of sarcastic. I've never, never picked up on that until uh, looking at various um, um, translations and, and saw this to the church of the Laodiceans instead of to the church at Pergamum, to the church at Sardis, to the, you know, whatever. So um, anyway, I think uh, what it is, is saying here is that the, the Laodiceans followed their own majority rather than the word of God. They would, uh, uh, instead of looking at the scriptures, they would say, well, what do you guys think? You know, maybe uh, this is good or maybe this is not so good. So I don't know. Has anybody run across that before and uh, had, you know, any kind of, uh, have you ever seen that before that uh, he's talking about the, the church of the Laodiceans rather than, than you know, whatever, uh, the church at a, a specific location? Does that, does that make any sense to anybody? No comment. Um, it seems like the church, Michael Jones, it seems like the churches nowadays uh, picking and choosing what they like in the scriptures. Well, yeah, I mean, let, uh, um, it is uh, what they call cafeteria style uh, Christianity. And that uh, you can go in through, go through the line and you, okay, yes. I'll take me a, a little dose of uh, of uh, yeah, little dose of spirituality here, and I'll take a little dose of uh, of uh, the gift of helps here, and maybe a, a little gift of the fruit of the spirit here. But uh, oh no, that stuff about uh, uh, don't gossip and keeping your tongue and everything. Uh, I'll I'll pass on that. That's not for me. Or that uh, the other stuff that. Oh, um, uh, promiscuity. Hmm. I kind of like my promiscuity. I think I'll keep it. And, you know, they go on their, their, the way, you know, cafeteria style, uh, religion. So, um, it, it seems like what they did in with their government, in other words, the government, what you were saying, they kind of ebb and flowed with whoever was in power. They negotiated, they didn't ever take a stance. So, that kind of carried over into their church and they had the same idealisms where they just, uh, you know, they had a menu of items that they picked out to, to exactly. believe in. Exactly. That's exactly the way it, uh, it, uh, uh, went. So, and then, uh, Yeshua said that he would spew or vomit them out of his mouth. Now, um, I don't know if, um, if people would, uh, um, I mean, I, I suspect that uh, he's saying that they could lose their, their salvation. So anyway, next, Yeshua speaks of their wealth. Let's, uh, he, this is going ahead with, our, with his rebuke. said, um, um, 
evidently these believers in Laodicea were wealthy and they used their uh, their their money to do good deeds. So, you know, in contrast to some of the other cities uh, who had made, you know these strong trade guilds and so forth, and so the believers they couldn't get into the the industry because they had these trade guilds that that you had to go and and bow down to these various uh, uh, idols to get into the trade guild. Um, in uh, Laodicea, evidently they didn't have anything like that, which, which kind of goes along with their their attitude of, you know, we'll go along to get along. You know, you don't want to bow down to this guy. Nah, it's fine. I don't care. So the uh, the believers then were able to kind of, you know, the a rising, uh, a rising economy floats all boats. And so evidently they were also um, uh, wealthy. And uh, Yeshua says that, uh, you know, um, you know, he says um, he was not impressed, and I and I have in my notes. I, the reason I hesitated there, I looked at that in in, uh, in my notes, and it says yes, but Yeshua was impressed. No, he was not impressed. Um, they trusted in their money so much that they thought they needed that they they needed nothing. They every they they lacked for nothing, um, and wealth can be a huge blessing. Uh, I, you know, I wish I had it, um, but it, it can be a, a huge blessing, you know, when it's properly controlled, but it can be a, a curse that blinds a person to the point that they would never see the Lord as the source of their salvation. Remember when uh, Yeshua said it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than to, um, uh, for a rich man to get into heaven. And while I'm here, we're going to chase that rabbit into the needle's eye. Uh, you've heard all your life probably that in um, that when uh, you, Yeshua was talking about this, that it's easier for a, a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to uh, go to heaven. Um, he meant exactly what he said. He was talking about the eye of a needle, you know, needle and thread. He wasn't talking about some mythical little door in the side of a building, in the side of the wall, where the camel had to uh, take off all of his uh, his uh, burden and uh, all of his saddle and everything, and then get down on his knees and scrunch through the door, and that he could make it through the through the city gate. Well, that is that's that's uh, bogus because if they had something like that that would have been a weak point in which they could be attacked. And so uh, there has never yet been found the eye of a needle in a city's uh, fortifications. So I think that's somebody, uh, you know, some some uh, person that, uh, I don't know what, whether you'd say they made it up or whatever, but um, Yeshua used uh, hyperbola when he was teaching. That was a, that was a, um, um, it was just a common practice and a common way of teaching back then. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, he says, okay, if your eye offends you, well then pluck it out. Well, no, he, you know, that was hyperbola. What do you, and he says, if your hand offends you, cut it off, you know. Well, that's no, because the self-mutilation was definitely not taught in the Bible. And so he was using uh, a technique uh, that we would call hyperbola to get the point across that, uh, um, you know, just to, you know, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous that, yeah, you remember that. So everybody remembers the eye of the needle thing. Is there, is there anybody that uh, has not heard that uh, eye of the needle uh, business with the camel? Anybody here never heard that before? Okay, I guess everybody has heard that before. So um, anyway, uh, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll drag the rabbit back through the eye of the needle now and uh, we'll continue on. Uh, the problem with the Laodiceans is that they trusted in their money all the while their spiritual life was a disaster. Uh, Yeshua said they were miserable. They were pitiable. You know, something to be pitied. You know, you're just, and they were poor. 
blind and naked. Now that just about covers it all. I mean, you could, uh, uh, we could go and do a, a teaching on each one of those things about being miserable. And, you know, uh, look at how many very wealthy people uh, decide to commit suicide. They're miserable in some cases for whatever reason. I, you know, I don't know that, um, but wealthy people commit suicide. I don't know if they commit suicide at any higher rate than uh, than us poor people do, but uh, uh, at at any rate, they can be just as miserable, um, and uh, you know they're pitiable. I guess you just because you got lots of money doesn't mean that you're happy, and uh, um, you know, you can be very very wealthy, but then just have a poor attitude and just a poor personality and just yeah, you don't like being around them, and they can be blind. You can be very wealthy, and then just be blind to the things that are are around you that perhaps need to be done, or blind to the the people that are around you that that actually help you and and make you what you are. And in the end, it's the emperor that has no clothes. Uh, they're they're you know, laid bare. They everybody knows them for for what they are. We see this um, uh, today often in the uh, the um, uh, Hollywood star. You know, the celebrity worship that uh, that goes on in the uh, in the United States. So, um, you know, that there are there are a bunch of people that really and truly. Um, yeah, it might be nice to have their money, but I wouldn't want to be them. I don't. I wouldn't want to be what they represent or, or um, you know, who they are, or how they live their lives or something. It's, uh, it's just not something that's me. I, I really, really would not uh, care to be anything like that. So um, let's go ahead with the um, uh, next, uh, next two verses. Yeshua tells the lukewarm church what they need to do. It says, I advise you, to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white clothes so that you may dress yourself and so the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Okay, since they were um, considered to be, you know, they considered themselves to be rich um, but they were spiritually poor. Uh, Yeshua, he advised them, he urged them to buy, um, you know, buy, and it, it's, a, it's a figurative uh, sense of buying, buy, um, and it implied the self-sacrifice. You know, buy it, uh, buy your self-sacrifice. The spiritual things that they really did need. Instead of real gold, they should buy gold refined by fire, namely pure spiritual riches. And um, uh, instead of buying these black garments, you know that the city was famous for the black wool garment. And so uh, they, the people there wore a lot of the black stuff. Um, he says to buy white garments, and that symbolizes righteousness, purity, con uh, you know, righteous conduct and purity and uh, um, you know, actually, it, it, you know, sacred, uh, sacred, festal uh, occasions like remember the priests when they uh, when uh, God told them to to dress a certain way they were uh, to uh, wear fine linen you know a white white linen so he's telling them to buy this uh, fine linen basically put on a different garment a different uh, a covering for yourself and um, he says, instead of the eye salve that the Laodiceans pr produced and sold, uh, they should purchase spiritual eye salve that, uh, that is probably, I would say, a reference to the Word of God. You know, so to get into the Word of God so that you can see where you are and see where you need to be. And uh, um, they would be able to see life realistically. Now, whereas, you know, the, the church in Smyrna, if you remember right, they were a, um, a rich, poor church. Yeshua says that you are so rich, even though they were in poverty, 
they were rich because they knew the things of God. They had grasped the things of God. They were, um, uh, they, they had it put together. Even though they were poor uh, in terms of uh, dollars and cents, they were very wealthy in the riches of the, of the uh, kingdom of God. Laodicea was right the opposite. It was a poor, rich church. In other words, they had lots of money, and uh, but their their whole their soul, their everything about them was uh, was poor, and uh, it was not something that uh, the Lord desired. He'd rather us uh, not have a whole lot of this world's uh, riches, but uh, we could uh, definitely lay up treasures in heaven. And he tells us to do that. All right. Uh, the Lord reminded his readers that the reason that uh, he said what he did and does what he does is because he loves them. He says, those that I love, I rebuke and, and uh, discipline. He says, therefore, be zealous um, and uh, repent. Um, the only way for spiritually cold, and here we're going back to that other uh, idea of uh, uh, cold being bad, for spiritually cold people to become spiritually hot in their love for the Lord is to repent or an about face, or as we say in Hebrew, it's a teshuva, where it's a 180 degree change. So Yeshua closes out his um, his letter, and I always uh, and, or oftentimes forget to put my uh, slide in there, but anyway, um, he closes out his letter here says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And to the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I myself overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So when Yeshua was on earth, he said in Matthew 18, 20, for for two or three are for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. The tragedy for the Laodicean, uh, the La Laodicean church, was that the Lord was not in their midst. They were having church, but Yeshua wasn't there. Even worse, they didn't even know he wasn't there. They were so wrapped up in their wealth and their good deeds and all the things that they did, they were self-sufficient. They did not need uh, the Lord. They didn't trust in the Lord to accomplish their pro programs and, and plans because they had plenty of money. They could do it themselves. And so Yeshua says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, dine with him, and he with me. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I myself have sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach is saying to Messiah's community. Now, um, Yeshua is standing at the door because he does not force himself on anyone. Um, in that time frame in, uh, in the Roman Empire, you know, if, if a Roman uh, soldier decided he wanted something of yours, he could just go and take it. And um, they would... Uh, uh, decide, well, we want to live in your house for a while. So they just knock on, uh, you know, they'd go through the door, kick you out, take your place for a while, and then go on their merry way. Yeshua was not like that. Um, he, uh, you know, you must invite him in. He's not going to come in on his own. And because of the hardness of their hearts and their self-sufficiency and complacency, not everyone will hear or recognize the Lord's voice speaking to them. In John 10, 27, Yeshua says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And we can hear and recognize the voice of the Lord speaking to us. In, uh, in Bible times, when someone knocked on the door uh, at your house and you asked them who was there, they would not give their name. They, they would say, you know, if they were a real proper person, they would say, you know, you'd knock on the door and they said, who's there? And they would say, it is I. And uh, or if they were like, you know, maybe from the Texas portion of Israel, they would uh, they would say, hey, it's me, Bubba, let me in. Uh, and they were, uh, you know, they were able you were able to recognize the voice on the other side of the door because you didn't really have a peephole that you could stick out, uh, stick your eye in and, 
um, and uh, look because somebody might poke you in the eye. So you just listened. And this was the ancient home alarm security system. You listened. In the book of Acts, Peter was, he was sprung from prison. Remember he was in prison? The earthquake, the angel came through, caused an earthquake, and, and uh, they, uh, they left. And so he went back to the uh, place where all the saints were uh, holed up praying, and he knocked on the door. And they sent a young girl over there and says, who is it? And then the next thing you know, she comes running back to where all the, the adults are and says, it's Peter, it's Peter. And this is, uh, you know, this, no, it can't be. And she says, no, I know it is. I heard his voice. She recognized his voice. Why? Because she knew him and she knew his voice. And then the adults came and opened the door. She did not open the door to him and let him in. Um, and so um, to those that know his voice and let him in their lives, he makes a great promise. He says, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. That's a very Jewish way of saying that when you dine with somebody, you're their friend, you're their family, a trusted companion. Back in the day, Jews would not go to a Gentile's house and eat because they didn't know how the food was prepared. They, they probably, the food had been offered to idols or whatever. They would not go to a Gentile's house and eat. A Gentile could come to a Jew's house and eat, and the Jew would eat um, because he knew how the food was prepared. He had no problem with that. But um, for uh, you to go in and, and commune with somebody, remember when, when we were talking in uh, um, uh, some of the other uh, Galatians uh, where uh, you know, Peter, and that was a big deal. It was table fellowship. Table fellowship was a very big deal. And so what Yeshua is saying is here is, look, if you'll let, let me in, we'll come in and we will have table fellowship like uh, good friends, like good family, trusted companion. Uh, we're, you know, we're buds. Uh, and uh, so that's what he's, what he's saying. And finally, to the overcomer, the Lord further promises that he will sit with him on his throne meaning that he will share his rule of the nations. When the Lord returns, he will not only sit on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem as the king of Israel, he will sit also on the throne of the heavenly father as king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, he will rule the nations as God's earthly representative and his covenant people will rule, rule with him. There were two thrones. God had his throne and Yeshua sat uh, on the right hand of the Father in that in that throne. Okay, get my hands here. But also then, Yeshua is going to have his own throne, and that's going to be centered in, uh, in Jerusalem. So then uh, it says that you will be able to sit with me on my throne. Okay, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, like, when uh, you know a, a grandfather sits down and and he's got all these grandkids coming up and sitting in his lap. No, what he's what he's saying is that you will be part of my ruling class and that you will uh, be there to rule the the nations, the world, um, as uh, you know in in the uh, in the um, in the world to come. So, and then he closes out with the, the words, and I probably, yeah, okay, and I probably had another you know, slide here. Um, it says, um, who has an, he who has an ear, let him hear. And um, um, so here are my, my points here that uh, uh, fellowship was very, very, very important. And uh, if you could go in and eat with somebody, that was a, a very important thing. Remember when Yeshua would go into the into the homes of uh, people that uh, the scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees considered not to be very reputable. He was not going in the homes of pagans um, or uh, Gentiles. He was going into the homes of of, of uh, Israelites of Jews who uh, didn't quite uh, measure up, and they were maybe not politically correct. Uh, it comes to mind somebody like Zacchaeus who was a tax collector. So anyway, uh, for the overcomer, it says he will dine, he will fellowship with the Lord, he will sit on Yeshua's throne with him, and he will rule uh, the nations. Now, um, now I've, I've uh, summarized this lesson with a, a little chart that uh, you know, it, it, it summarizes, it's not all of it, but it kind of summarizes the promises given by Yeshua to the to the um, 
to the overcomers. And uh, note that he said, he said to the overcomers. He didn't say to the hanger honors. Okay, uh, there's there's a difference. Uh, to fully experience the blessings of the Lord, we have to be overcomers and not somebody that uh, is just going to be uh, one that just hangs on or um, uh, is you know like the uh, Laodiceans that uh, they were the um, you know they were the lackadaisical, the lukewarm person or the ones like like I, I say sometimes that uh, people that are involved in the took us ministry you know that's where they come to synagogue and they park themselves on their took us and that's all they do and uh, then they go home and feel like okay I've done my part um, and really don't go out and do anything uh, for the Lord so anyway we've got this